think you're okay if I record it, Paul? Yeah, yeah. I, I will uh, uh, try to avoid saying anything that's uh, actionable. So perfect. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm not worried about you saying anything. Right. Um, so let's let's get going here. So obviously, uh, in a quick introduction on Paul, he is at uh, uh, City University of New York Grad Center, Stone Center for Economic Inequality, uh, Nobel Prize winning economist, New York Times writer, best-selling author. I could keep going on. Um, I've had the privilege of now knowing Paul for six, seven years. I I can only think editions, two editions, three editions, three editions. Three editions. We're on our we're on our third edition. I I, yeah. I work with Paul, and I've had. A lot of uh, fun working with him and his wife, Robin, on their textbook. That's really how this relationship's formed. Um, how does someone in Washington State get connected with Paul? Um, kind of luck, right? And more than anything, hard work. Uh, so I'm going to stop and kind of open it up to Paul. And the first question I really have for him is, as we're in the middle of this health pandemic and, and kind of economic reality results from this pandemic. Uh, it wasn't too long ago, 10 years ago, we were battling the Great Recession. So one of the things I would love for Paul to, to talk about is how lessons we've learned from the Great Recession are kind of aiding us today, helping us today get through this recovery. All right. So, um, I mean, I think it actually is helpful. Uh, in a peculiar way that we went through the Great Recession, even though this is very different. I mean, it's, this, is, um, this is not one of your standard, this is not a recession like any other. Uh, the, the, the metaphor I've been using is that it's, uh, it's like a medically induced coma, uh, where you deliberately shut down some of the brain functions in order to give a chance to, to recover from a, something very acute. And uh, the biggest thing that's happened to the economy is we basically just shut down whole sectors which are uh, contact intensive. Uh, so no restaurants, no sports events, no uh, uh, pretty much no non-essential retail. Um, and that's a huge part of the economy. And most of the job losses we've seen so far are there, um, but there, are, and, and there's not too much uh, that we can say about in terms of the economics of doing that, it's uh, uh, there we mostly are deferring to the, the epidemiologists uh, for you know how much uh, do we need to shut down and for how long. I think the overwhelming consensus among serious economists is to let the epidemiology uh, dictate this. Don't play games with it. Um, the um, the thing where that you where economics comes in. Uh, it, there, there's there's some issues of there are very huge issues of equity and inequality which we probably want to come back to, but there's also the immediate question of does this spill over, uh, you know, on top of this induced coma, do we then get a regular old financial crisis and conventional recession on top of it, uh, because you've got some very large number, maybe 20% of the workforce suddenly thrown out of jobs without incomes, businesses without sales. Uh, that could easily lead to a collapse in spending, even on goods which we are still able to produce. It can lead to financial crisis because uh, a lot of firms might are, are in, in dire straits and many may go under. And, um, and what we've done is that uh, the financial side, Federal Reserve, uh, what they learned from, from last time is, is that uh, uh, bring out the bazooka and use it right away. So the Fed has gone out there, huge amounts of money thrown at the financial markets to avoid uh, uh, this turning into a series of, of, of bank runs and, and equivalents of bank runs uh, with quite a lot of success. Uh, so we, but we came pretty close. There was, there was a period just about two weeks ago when the financial markets were looking really dodgy. And it's sort of the, uh, it's hard to, to talk a lot about what didn't happen, but there was a, there, there was a moment there when it was looking like, oh my God, we're going to have a, a 2008 on top of the pandemic. And, and, uh, and I think it's the Fed, to some extent, its counterparts uh, overseas that, that did that. Um, and then, um, you know, fiscal stimulus is not really what we're at. People are misnaming that bill we passed. But uh, one way to avoid having a, a secondary recession is to provide a lot of aid to people who are uh, losing their normal sor uh, source of livelihood. We're doing some of that. And I think a lot of the questions going forward is uh, we clearly haven't done enough 
uh, and uh, but are we going to do uh, the rest? Are we going to do enough to to avoid secondary consequences? And particularly, are we going to do enough to avoid having a uh, a recession that persists beyond the pandemic? So those are those are all and and all of this requiring you know there's no off the shelf models. Uh, we're we're having to make up our analytical frameworks uh, on the fly as we do this. I'm not, uh, Ryan, are you there or? Oof. <laughs> I got to remember to unmute myself. So yeah. you and I have had conversations on uh, inequality where um, this recession is really highlighting some of those gaps, both in who's coming down with the virus, but also who is now at the front lines fighting the virus. Yeah. So how does that work in terms of us going forward? Well, yeah, there's multiple dimensions here. Um, and first of all, at, at one level, there's just a lot of, um, uh, you know, the inequality people talk about horizontal versus vertical inequality. We just sort of talk about the vertical as the, uh, the bottom quintile versus the top quintile in general. But then there's also just unequal impacts of, uh, on different groups of people, not necessarily aligned with the longer term inequality. And, and what we have here is actually it's both. So um, some well-paid white color people are actually losing their jobs in this. They're, they're caught up in it. It's, a, it's very, very uneven its impact. And some you know, blue collar uh, uh, minimum wage workers are really not affected because they just happen to be employed in, uh, in industries or places that are really not very much in, in, in the front lines here. Uh, but uh, so here we are, you know, again, something like 20% quarter of the workforce is suddenly, their, their industries are temporarily shut down. Um, and it turns out that they are disproportionately also lower wage workers, um, Retail, uh, fast food, you know, uh, restaurants, but a lot of restaurant employment is fast food, not uh, not for, not a whole lot of five star Michelin restaurants in that category, um, and um, often without health insurance, uh, with uh, so that that the um, and the social distancing, the ability to uh, protect yourself, is very class related. Uh, it's uh, if you're somebody who uh, uh, take, has to take mass transit to work or someone who lives in a highly crowded neighborhood. Uh, so the, the, those, are the, those are the people who are most uh, at risk, although a little bit further down the line, the rural poor are going to be in, in big trouble too because they, um, it, the virus is slower to spread there because of low population density. But when it does, and it will, uh, then you have a lack of an adequate health infrastructure in poor rural areas. So it's a, uh, um, it's turning out that the, the, the usual inequality things, which were already to some extent issues of life and death are now even more so. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the, it, everything gets a lot harsher. Uh, all of the, the existing issues about inequality gets thrown into much starker relief uh, than, than they were before. So with the inequality piece, right, and, and how this is playing yeah. out, how do we look at this decision of, and you're hearing President Trump talk about reopening the economy, how do you balance this value of life where most epidemiologists, economists are, are expecting this virus to spread to these rural communities? How do we balance these two dynamics? Oh, I think the overwhelming view of you know, economists and and which is actually borne out. We you know, the closest thing we've had to this was the influenza pandemic after World War One, um, and it turns out that cities that were you know that people did social distancing then too, and it varied across cities. And the cities that that uh, cracked down hard at the beginning actually ended up doing better economically as well as having fewer deaths. And um, a, a premature opening up of the economy is probably going to backfire even in purely economic terms because you see, you'll see a spike in cases and, uh, and, and we'll have to shut down again. Um, and as you can see a, a little bit there, you know, we're getting some uh, real time 
uh, information here. They, it, there's been variation among countries in, in how strict they are. Not necessarily. Uh, obviously, it, it's, it, you would think it would be you know, countries that are big government, strong welfare states would be also very strict. And it's not that consistent. And it turns out that one of the countries that really sort of said, oh, uh, let's, let's not be too, too strict here, but keep the economy going was Sweden. And it turns out that the Swedes have a very high death rate and their economic performance is not noticeably better than, than their neighbors, um, which who have had much stricter rules. So I don't think that's uh, so much the issue. I think the, the question is, is, is less uh, uh, how do we get the economy going and, and more uh, how do we get support to the people who are on the front lines. Uh, front lines economically, of course, also very much the front lines medical profession, but, but just thinking about the people who are hurt most economically. Um, I gotta say, they, a little surprisingly, that uh, that big bill, that $2 trillion uh, bill, the, the CARES Act, um, the, uh, is on, on that front, it was actually better than I expected. Um, we, we have these un, enhanced unemployment insurance. Uh, it covers more people than normal unemployment insurance. It's supposed to cover gig workers, independent contractors, as well as, as regular employees. Um, and it's uh, $600 a month extra on top of unemployment benefits, which means that for low wage workers, it's actually pretty close to full replacement of their lost income. So this is actually, you know, that's the kind of thing you want to do. Uh, the, the idea that for the sake of, of, of the workers, we need to start taking risks with the virus doesn't seem to actually uh, make sense. Okay, so you mentioned the $2 trillion CARES Act. Let's look at baseline this year. We were already in about a trillion dollar deficit, throw in probably another trillion on top of yeah. the $2 trillion, throw in another, what, 500 billion trillion lost in tax revenue. Um, we're talking an annual deficit in excess of $4 trillion. Yeah, 20% of GDP. It's 20% uh, of GDP. Are you, is that a concern? Is that something that we should look at and start worrying about uh, rising interest rates? Should we start worrying about with Fed policy, skyrocketing yeah. inflation? Some of these things you do here being talked yeah. about, and we're certainly a forefront of the concern following the Great Recession. Yeah, but that was wrong during the Great Recession. Well, not yeah. I <laughs> everyone who worried about debt, then nothing happened. Uh, everyone who worried about inflation was wrong, um, and everything we can see right now says that that we're still in that situation. Uh, that that debt is just not an issue, um, uh, and inflation is just not an issue. The um, the uh, one of the, I mean, partly we were already in a situation of a world that looked like it had, uh, you know, lots of savings all dressed up with nowhere to go. There were all the, the we, we had very low interest rates. It appeared that we didn't just, that people were eager to lend to governments because they couldn't find other investments. Um, and that's even more so now. Now you have people obviously have cut back on consumption, saving is way up, business investment is way down. You know, who's going to build an office park in a plague? Uh, and um, the, uh, uh, I, I was checking the, uh, uh, the Treasury Real Yield Curve uh, website. Um, inflation protected US long term bonds were yielding minus 0.56% as of uh, yesterday afternoon. So in real terms, people are paying the government to hold their, their savings. Uh, so we have no immediate problem. And if you ask, well, isn't this a longer term problem? It's probably not. I mean, it's, uh, I don't know if, if you're, how much you've been telling the students about the people like Olivier Blanchard, who is the, uh, you know, the, the most mainstream person in, in, on the planet uh, in terms of economics, uh, whose presidential address last year was saying, hey, you know, we've been worried too much about debt. Interest rates are lower than growth rates. Debt kind of tends to melt away instead of snowballing. So, um, no, I'm not concerned. We're, we're going to have, even with all of this, we're going to end up with a lower level of debt relative to GDP than way lower than Japan, which is not having any problems, uh, lower than Britain had for most of the 20th century. So I'm just not seeing that. So for the U.S. kind of being the safe haven, which was the result of the Great yeah. also after the Great Recession, 
are we worried about Europe? And we, it, you know, interestingly, yeah. Greece has done a, a pretty remarkable job with their uh, coronavirus cases, but this spreading to Italy, I'm asking because we have a lot of students that study abroad in Italy. Right. What's the concern fiscally for that country that you're seeing? Because I know you're following Europe too. Yeah, Italy, um, Italy has always been the place <laughs> it, if, if the euro cracks, uh, Italy is probably where it cracks. Uh, Italy is deep in debt. It's not, Italy is not, they haven't actually been big spenders uh, in, for the past generation, but they inherited a lot of debt from previous uh, bad periods. And for reasons, nobody fully understands the Italian economy just as a very slow growth economy. They just, they just uh, are kind of a stagnant economy, which means that <clears throat> even though, at least until a few weeks ago, their interest rates were pretty low, uh, the arithmetic of their debt is just way worse than anybody else's. And then they get hit really hard by the coronavirus with all of the uh, economic and, and uh, uh, expenditure fallout. So their, their fiscal situation gets much worse. Um, and they're not getting much help from the rest of Europe. Uh, it, it seemed like a, at, at a time like this, you really, really wanted to have something, people were talking about Corona bonds, some, some way or other to make, make sure that, that countries like Italy and Spain, which is to some extent in the same position, were getting access to, um, to cheap funds uh, during the emergency. And it's basically just not happening. Uh, the Germans are being very German. Uh, the Dutch are being <laughs> even more German than the Germans. And, the, uh, um, and so the possibility that you know, Italy has a populist government not uh, so far has been uh, not quite willing to go the whole length, but the idea that, that you could have either a, a deliberate or a forced uh, default on the part of Italy and that that would create havoc is really there. I mean, it's a... Uh, uh, Europe is a monetary union without a government, and that's a that's a that's a pretty dangerous thing to have, especially in the face of a shock like this. Yeah, and I think that's what a lot of people forget is we are a monetary union, but we're also a fiscal union. In, in that's Europe. right. The, you, when we looked uh, during the Great Recession, I I, I had some fun. I, I I mean, it was serious also, but I was, I'd like to compare Florida and Spain, uh, which in some ways were similar. They both were, you know, they both warm places with lots of people have second homes and a lot of tourism and they, uh, and housing bubbles uh, that collapsed. And, um, uh, but Florida automatically, nobody had to say, let's give aid to Florida. Florida automatically got a huge influx of federal aid because the Medicare payments and the social security payments kept coming from Washington. Uh, a lot of the unemployment benefits were paid from Washington. The Florida banks, a lot of banks failed in Florida, but they were all bailed out from Washington. Uh, so, and Spain had none of that. Spain had to deal with all of the financial fallout of, of their burst housing bubble um, on their own. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're uh, you know, we can, now it, it's not clear we're taking full advantage of, of the fact that we do have a federal government and don't want to get too far into politics there, but you know, we have this, <laughs> these, these peculiar, you know, we ha now have a, uh, in terms of reopening the economy, we now have a, uh, uh, a, a Northeastern alliance of states, which are basically saying, pay no attention to that man in the White House. Uh, we will, we, the governors of the Northeastern states will do it. And you have a similar one out there on the West Coast. Uh, we do. So, um, but still, uh, the, and of course, uh, to the extent that we're relying upon guys who run the printing presses, uh, the Federal Reserve or the European Central Bank. Federal Reserve has effectively unlimited resources because um, Treasury stands behind it. it, uh, it we don't worry if, you know, if, if the Fed ends up trying to save the economy by buying a bunch of junk bonds and they go bad, which is a real possibility here. Uh, all right. Uh, Treasury Department will make up for those losses. Not clear who stands behind the European Central Bank. So yeah. uh, it, it's, uh, the, yeah, having, having a country can, kind of tends to be useful. So we're getting some uh, questions coming in. So I will, I have a few from students I'll ask you. Um, there's no such thing as a bad question, Sloan. How do you see labor markets adjusting post-crisis? Does this change 
demand for industry, this work from home. What do you see in that avenue? Okay, there, there's both a macro and a micro question. So one question is when once the pandemic subsides, assuming that you kind of get it under control, do we, how quickly do we recover? And I'm, I'm actually kind of worried that we're going to have an extended period of convalescence, that, uh, that there will be a lot of financial damage uh, to done to, to families, to businesses, and to uh, state and local governments, and that they will uh, have to do, that people will be trying to rebuild their rainy day funds uh, for, for a long time. And so we're going to, that we probably have some economic weakness coming out of that for uh, quite a long time after, even after the the, uh, the virus lets up, um, the it's really. I mean, we're still trying to figure out how this changes. How much more telecommuting uh, do do we get out of this? Uh, the um, I mean, before just before this, we've been certainly doing a lot. Of, the question was how much of education? Uh, how does online education, uh, how do things like this you know, substitute for actual classroom experiences? Um, and the verdict mostly was it's actually a pretty inferior substitute for teaching, that uh, it, better than nothing, but and we're forced to do it now, but, but uh, I think uh, uh, by and large, uh, educators will want to get back to actual classroom experiences as soon as they can, um, as soon as they can safely. Uh, um, business meetings, business people do an awful lot of travel and is how much of that is necessary uh, and will people stop doing it? Um, but we, it's not, I think we, that's still unanswered. I mean, it's uh, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the one place I can see it, by the way, to, um, I'm a, uh, uh, I, I, I'm kind of averse to doing TV. Uh, you know, they, name people know and they want me on, but then you go on a TV show, the cable news show, and it's, uh, you go to the studio, which takes a bunch of time. You sit around in the green room, you have to make up, and then you get your five minutes on air and it's just not worth it. And now I'm doing it you know, right here. Uh, and it's, um, and as far as I'm concerned, it's good enough. And the reason, uh, th that it's it's good enough is everybody's kind of lowered their standards. You don't have to look, uh, uh, you don't have to be wearing a, all that makeup. You don't have to have all of that perfection of the of of the visuals. Um, but I I'm wondering. I suspect that that um, uh, in a lot of places people will want the kind of production values back. But I don't know. Uh, it there are people out there saying you know, okay. Uh, that ever, from now on, every time someone proposes a, a, a get together, you say, couldn't this be a Zoom? And uh, actually every time somebody proposes a Zoom, you say, couldn't this be an email? Uh, so uh, maybe, maybe we, we, we do shift, but it's, it, it's unclear. Uh, we, um, I, I'm not sure whether we'll end up as a result of all this, either learning that we can do without face-to-face -face flesh meats, do people still use that phrase? Whether we can do without flesh meats or whether, uh, uh, or whether we'll have relearned the, the value of actual personal contact. So I unmuted Peter, because Peter had a question on supply chain. So Peter, if you want to start your video, you can certainly ask Paul, let you guys interact with Paul a little bit. I don't need to do it. Uh, hey, Paul, my question was, what will the uh, impact be on the global supply chain for medical de devices and pharmaceutical products going forward? Okay, uh, that's an interesting, um, yeah, actually Robin and I were just rushing back to see what we need to change in our, in the uh, textbook chapter on trade. <laughs> um, the, um, uh, what's turning out, so one of the hoary old arguments for protectionism is national security. And, uh, which everybody agrees. I mean, and, and international trade law says that it's okay to have tariffs to maintain industries that are essential for national security. Um, but people have always thought of that in terms of you know, basically the ability to produce tanks if they, during the next war or whatever. Um, and there was a lot of mockery because the, uh, the 
current administration was using national security as an excuse for tariffs on a bunch of things that didn't really sound like national security, you know, aluminum imports from Canada. Uh, but pharmaceuticals, um, I think the, the issue here has been that a lot of countries, including our own, have been in the crisis slapping um, uh, controls or bans on exports of uh, medical supplies that are in, in, in short supply. Um, and if you're in a world where countries are going to do that, if you're in a world where when there's a pandemic, uh, the countries that produce N95 masks or, that, uh, or ventilators or, uh, uh, or I don't know what uh, my medical ignorance will show here, but it turns out actually swabs apparently is now a, a real uh, constraint. Um, that if you're in a situation where countries will respond to a pandemic by, by cutting off exports, then maintaining a domestic capacity to produce those things becomes a, a valid national security concern. So we'll, I think we will see more of that. Now, whether this is going to affect uh, globalization more broadly, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, so uh, I always use, you know, this thing is a, uh, uh, it's, is made by an incredibly complex global production process that is, uh, uh, that ends in China, but, but has many different, uh, now there's no particular reason to believe that container ships are, are transmitting the virus. In fact, I'm pretty sure they're not, it's people that are doing it, but how much does, do these long global supply chains depend upon, uh, the ability of people to go back and forth as well? Um, so, um, uh, I've been reading some stuff. There, there are, yeah, I mean, there are expat communities. What, sorry? No, there are expat communities, uh, you know, in, in places like Thailand. Uh, Thailand turns out to be full of expat Japanese business people who oversee the factories in Thailand that are producing stuff that goes into the Japanese supply chain. Um, at the moment, most of those people apparently are staying in place in Thailand. Uh, because they've got a job to do and uh, travel is difficult, but will we be in a world you know, two years from now where uh, a Japanese executive who said, okay, um, we're sending you to Bangkok to oversee operations will say, oh, I don't want to be away from, from my uh, home uh, uh, you know, social safety net medical system. Um, and if, if, that's, if that turns out to be a big problem, uh, then, then we're going to have a, uh, a, a contraction. We're going to see a, a, a lot less international trade than we currently have. Okay, good, thanks. So there's, there was a few trade questions. I think you got to, to, to both of those. Liliana, you're going to be up next. I am unmuting you. So feel free to ask your question. Okay, so I kind of have two. My first one is kind of talking about um, the different industries and kind of who's going to be the big winners versus who's going to suffer the most. And if those suffering right now will manage to recover. And then kind of the second one that's kind of almost kind of paired with it is, do you think the economic recovery will be U-shaped, V-shaped or something different? Okay. So I'll do the second one first. I think the, I'm, I'm in the swoosh camp. Think of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Nike swoosh that we uh, uh, so it's a very steep descent and then a gradual return. I, I don't think, I mean, we could be, you know, this is, we have no prior experience here, but uh, my guess is that, first of all, relaxation of restrictions is going to be a, not happen on one day. There's not going to be a, a, a VC day, a vic victory over COVID-19 day when everything is, is, is all back to normal. It'll be a gradual reduction and possibly uh, one that involves, uh, you know, two steps forward and one step back when we see that, that, uh, that uh, there are new outbreaks. Uh, that's kind of what we're seeing in a few places like Singapore right now. Um, the, um, uh, some things, I mean, uh, one thing that really ha clearly has been a growth industry now is uh, online delivery. Um, Amazon uh, if I'm counting up correctly, it's higher as something like 175,000 people uh, so far in, in, in this crisis. The, uh, um, as well as, by the way, Amazon, you know, the, the user experience is that, that it's all digital, untouched by human hands, and you, 
uh, something just appears at your doorstep. Uh, but the reality is that Amazon has this vast network of distribution centers with hundreds of thousands of workers. Um, the reason that you're, they're able to deliver stuff so fast is that they have a, uh, almost anywhere you are, there's a distribution center not more than a couple of hours drive away. Um, and um, since people, I think people are learning even more than before the virtue of, of being the convenience, but it's now become the safety of relative safety of doing this, that that's going to change. Um, there are some things I would have thought would be killed by this, that, but uh, early evidence is I'm wrong. Um, I find it hard to understand why anybody would ever get on a cruise ship again. Um, and yet it turns out that cruise ship bookings for next year are quite high. Uh, there actually even appears to be some pent up demand. There appear to be, uh, they're unusually high that, that people who will have not been able to take cruises uh, are booking them for 2021. And so God knows uh, it's, uh, I, I would have thought, you know, uh, that, that, you know, I, if given a choice between uh, death and shuffleboard, I would probably, uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway, that's, that's apparently what's happening. So is the Contra Krugman cruise uh, still going That's on? That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> if people don't know, there is actually a cruise, uh, an annual cruise uh, uh, devoted entirely to, um, to denouncing me, which is kind of flattering. <laughs> it is. It is hosted by a, a, a very staunch group of libertarians that yeah. um, I, I, I meant to look that up to see if it was still yeah. going on. Um, let's go to Sean with your question. Sean, I have oops, unmuted you maybe. It won't let me unmute you for some reason. Oh, you're unmuted. So go for it, Sean. Um, this isn't a question regarding coronavirus, but a question about macroeconomics at large. Um, so in recent years, we've seen um, a reduction in uh, inter-country uh, inter inequality, but a, um, yeah. a rise in intra-country uh, inequality. And what do you see as the main um, driver of this? And how can countries like the US combat this problem? Okay. And by the way, this, this is the, um, uh, uh, I don't know, Ryan, if you do this, the, the elephant curve. Uh, my, my colleague, Branko Milanovic at, at Stone Center did this really, uh, it, it looks very simple, but the amount of work that went into it is enormous. He, he basically asked, what's, what's happened to income growth taking the world as a whole? So just take uh, individuals, rank them from poorest to richest and, and construct an estimate of their income growth. And what it looks like is there, there's, a, uh, um, there's the Chinese middle class, which is seeing huge income growth. There's the global 1% up there that has seen uh, huge income growth. And then there's a bunch of countries at the bottom who really are still not sharing in this, but there's also kind of the working class in the, uh, there we are. There's the, the elephant. Um, uh, and um, now this, the, it didn't always look like that. So I, I actually asked Bronco to, to do an elephant gr graph type thing for, uh, for the previous period, for, the, uh, for 1970 through, uh, through 1988, uh, uh, which he was able to do. And it's, it's pretty much flat. There's nothing, there's nothing like that going on. Uh, so it, it's, it coincides, Nin the circa 1990 is also when you start to see this hyper-globalization, this explosion of, of international trade, um, and probably linked to a combination of um, the WTO, China joining the world market, and, uh, and containerization, uh, being one of those unglamorous technologies that has really transformed the world. Now, whether that's responsible for what we're seeing uh, is a little unclear because most people, um, um, globalization is probably critical in the rapid growth in incomes in poorer countries. So the convergence in incomes, the reduction in, in uh, international inequality uh, probably has a fair bit to do with globalization. Uh, on the other hand, most of the people who've tried to work on the sources of increasing inequality within countries generally find that trade is a, is a factor, but not the dominant factor. So uh, it's not clear that there's a single cause to, to this thing, um, but it is really striking. It's a, uh, uh, in a way that the history of the world that these past 30 years is, the, is, the, is that, that curve. And it's a, uh, uh, a small elite uh, pulling away from everybody else. Uh, the, uh, a lot of people in previously very poor countries making their way up 
uh, the scale and uh, the, uh, but a significant part of the population of wealthy countries not really getting ahead. Okay, let's go to Callum. I'm going to unlock you. You had a question, and I'm sure Paul's going to love a question about Peter Navarro. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, fun fact about Peter Navarro, I met him about four years ago. He taught my sister in accounting class, but off topic, but he released a report to the president in January talking about the economic impact of COVID-19 and all that fun stuff. Do you think that in his outline, some of the information came out about if we stopped earlier, we could have prevented more of an economic hardship and more life aid. Would you agree if we prevented it earlier, we could have had that? Or do you think the steps that we took would have just been the same if we prevented it earlier with the numbers that we're seeing and the economic hardship we're seeing as well? The way I, I mean, I've been actually trying to think this through. It's not, it's not quite as easy a question as you might think. Um, because you, if you really want to stop the spread and you don't have, I mean, the, the optimal thing. So if we moved really quickly, not only recognizing the threat, but also developing, uh, getting those tests out there so that we were able to track it down, we could do what South Korea has done, which was um, a limited shutdown, but uh, contact tracing. And so really managing to limit the spread by, by, uh, uh, by, by, catching uh, outbreaks before they managed to be, get big. Um, that's, there were multiple reasons we didn't do that. So not just failure to recognize the whole series of missteps. <clears throat> Once the thing has gotten going, what you need to do to stop the spread is pretty much the same thing we're doing now, which is the total lockdown. Um, but what I think is, so we would probably be seeing something like uh, the rise in unemployment we're seeing now. Uh, even if we had reacted earlier, what 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 would have happened is that we would um, it would have had to go on a much shorter time than it's it's likely to. So we, we might, as as it now stands, we may be looking at s several months of twenty percent unemployment. Whereas if we had acted earlier, it might have been just a few weeks uh, because the we would have had a much smaller base of infected people to begin with, and once we'd locked those people down, basically. Um, the the uh, the prevalence of the of the uh, of the virus in the population would have come way down uh, quite quickly. So the I think it's it's less the depth than the than the duration of the slump that where we really missed those those uh, those few weeks that we um, that that we should have known that this was coming but didn't do anything uh, are going to be paid for, the, basically uh, something like every week that we waited is going to translate into a month of, of, of depression. Uh, and that's, uh, that, that's, that's where the, you get, given the initial failure on testing, that, that's where the next stage came. It's not so much that, that, you, that there was no way we were, that we were going to be able to keep restaurants and sports events open, uh, but we probably are going to have to keep them closed much, much longer than we would have if we'd reacted sooner. Um, good question. I, I'm going to encourage students. I haven't seen anyone do it. Uh, no Zoom selfies with Paul when you're asking your question yet. I'm, I'm surprised we haven't oh, well. seen that trend take off yet. Um, I mean, I have you a couple of that. Questions. You know, or you don't need an actual an actual <laughs> encounter to do that. Be given the marvels of digital. Anyway, I know, I know. Um, so this is from actually one of my students' parents. I asked if she wanted to ask it. And I never got heard from her, but. Um, do you think there was any underlining weaknesses in the U.S. economy or even that there was this rhetoric that we had entered our longest economic expansion really ever and you heard people say we were due for a recession? Were there any weaknesses out? I mean, I guess there's social safety net weaknesses, but uh, that are going to magnify the, the effects of the recession or prolong uh, our recovery efforts? Well, the way I would put it is, it's not so much, um, the, the thing about the US economy in those long ago days of you know, February, um, <laughs> was February. We, had, we had full employment um, and, uh, and that, uh, so that was good, uh, but we were at full employment only thanks to extremely low interest rates. 
Um, so we, we were basically an economy where private sector demand was weak. Uh, and we were only managing to sustain uh, employment by making money very cheap and also running quite big budget deficits even before all of this, um, which meant that uh, uh, we were, uh, we didn't have an easy response uh, to any kind of negative shock. Uh, so, I mean, what I had imagined was that we would eventually hit something, some kind of financial overreach or maybe a disruption of oil supply owing to something or other in the world, but the, uh, the, um, uh, and that we would find ourselves poorly placed to respond because the Fed, starting with interest rates very low, would have no room to cut and it would be hard to get uh, a big fiscal stimulus through. Uh, so, uh, or one way of been putting it, I, I said I didn't know where the next bump in the road was coming from, but I knew that we, uh, we had uh, that our shock absorbers were were completely shot, and so we weren't prepared for whatever the bump was going to be. Now, what's actually happened is sort of wild. It's it's uh, um, it had at least the initial impact, uh, not just I mean, uh, yeah, the Fed did cut interest rates to zero, which is not enough, but it's also doing massive. Uh, purchases of unconventional assets, which is helping. But we're also, uh, at least initially, uh, fiscal stimulus, which would you would have expected to be hard to get politically. We got a big uh, you know, $2 trillion spending bill, which that's uh, two and a half times the size of, of the Obama stimulus, uh, um, and uh, all in a very short period of time. So in terms of actual rate of outlay, it was five times what Obama did. Um, and because all of the normal political rules went out the window uh, in the face of the virus. Now, we're, I think some of those concerns may be coming back because we, right now what we really need is, we, we do need a lot more uh, cash outlays. We need, we need more, uh, particularly I, I'm, I'm focused a lot on hospitals and on state and local governments which didn't get remotely enough money in the first package. Um, and there's a lot of political resistance to that. Uh, at the moment, you know, there's a deadlock. The Senate Republicans uh, say they, they want more money for small businesses, but nothing else. And Democrats say, no, we won't agree to that unless you include aid for, for hospitals and state and local governments. And um, uh, so we're back in some ways. Uh, the old, old fashioned uh, political divisions have, have resurfaced and that's, uh, and, and that comes back in some ways to the underlying weakness of the economy. That's a, if, if we are deadlocked here, then we have a slump that probably persists even once the pandemic subsides. So do I, I think I've hit most questions that have been asked to me. Um, is there anyone out there that still wants to, I, 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 I booked Paul for an hour is what I promised him. Um, so, I don't want to take up yeah. too much of his time if he's got to run, but if there's other questions out there, um, wait, of course I get a new one. Um, oh, I'm going to let Hunter ask this one. He's got a little bit of a conspiracy going on. <laughs> uh -huh. I, I wouldn't say conspiracy. So I, I read a couple articles the other day from, from different news sources about how the intelligence community is thinking that this came out of the Wuhan lab more and more as they look into it. If that's yeah. the case, if that's the case, then, or even if that's not the case and it was wet markets, what is the foreign policy and economically or politically look like with us and abroad with China right now, especially because they do have a spot on the World Health Organization? Well, yeah, I mean, there's zero evidence that this came out of a lab or anything like that. And, uh, and uh, for what it's worth, I mean, a lot of places have got labs that, that uh, could come from. Um, and it's, it's true that the Chinese government wasn't honest uh, in its initial reporting. Uh, I've got to say, we're not exactly a, doing a great job of being honest in our reporting either. So, uh, you know, we're, it, um, I think the, the lesson here really, it, we, you can't be autarkic here. What you really need is actually a, a, a stronger international uh, policing. I mean, I, uh, uh, the WHO is a highly, it's a flawed organization, uh, but um, what we really need is a better WHO, not, not cutting it off. And the idea, uh, we can't turn, the Fortress America on, on microbes is just not going to work. So uh, that's, 
uh, and uh, now the, the and the, of course the one of the main points to make here uh, I think is even if correctly you say oh you know the Chinese were late to report and uh, whatever and that and that it has been true that uh, uh, that China is typically the source of, of ordinary flus. Uh, as, uh, has to do with livestock uh, and all of that. Um, but uh, you know, some countries, uh, South Korea, uh, have coped very well uh, with this, and they had exactly the same information that we did. So the our, our the, the main lessons here are: uh, if we can, we want a better stronger international regime for pandemics. I think everybody is now much more sensitized to that risk than they, they used to be. Um, and we, we need a much better uh, domestic response. Uh, the, uh, you know, in retrospect, we didn't know how good we had it when the, the way we, we, we dealt with Ebola or with swine flu, we actually uh, responded pretty well domestically to them and, and we didn't this time. Perfect. I'm going to have unmute Kendra. I have two good questions in here. Kendra, do you want to go ahead and ask yours or do we get chickens in the background? No, no chickens or kids today. Sorry. They're actually staying away. Um, uh, uh, by the so, way, I'm extremely unhappy that, uh, that Holmes the cat has failed to make an appearance. He's, he's been oh, showing up in a number of my interviews. The cat. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So um, I this morning uh, heard about uh, Senator Lindsey Graham, I believe, from North Carolina. He's saying that he wants to North compel Carolina. China to do debt forgiveness. I see that as being super unrealistic. <laughs> um, but if, it, if he could actually compel China to do that, would that essentially halt our trade? Is that another option for what he's proposing? Because I only heard a very small blurb about it, and I just shook my head. No, uh, Graham has been saying that we should punish the Chinese for their their role in letting this thing get out into the world by repudiating or partially repudiating. The Chinese have, have bought a lot of U.S. Treasury bills, um, which is it, it's deeply stupid. And it's not about cutting off trade. It's the fact, um, you know, everything I said about how U.S has great borrowing capacity and that we can borrow it very cheaply and all of that uh, comes from the fact that the world thinks of US government bonds as a, uh, as a very safe asset. And um, if we start saying, well, we don't like you, so we're not actually going to pay our debt to you. Um, and even, even if you've bought the rationale, if I were a foreigner, if I were actually any investor, uh, thinking of buying U.S. bonds, I would start to say, well, who knows? You know, that those Americans, they're strange people. They might decide that there's something about me that they don't like, and they'll, they'll decide that a debt to me isn't really a debt. And all of that suddenly goes out the window. We suddenly become a, a third world currency that, that people don't, uh, don't trust. Uh, so it's, it's an incredibly uh, irresponsible suggestion. I just, uh, you know, I, I understand that Lindsey Graham doesn't like the Chinese regime. I don't like the Chinese regime. Uh, but the idea that, that, that we can put, uh, that we can start selectively, uh, you know, selecting who actually uh, we pay, uh, that, that a bond is, is, isn't, uh, um, is, isn't a bond uh, it, if, it's, uh, if it's held by a country we don't like. Um, is is just opening the door. Uh, it, you know, it, it, particularly, you know, bear in mind that this is we have a uh, the U.S. government has you know, declared that imports of aluminum from Canada were a national security risk. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's a pretty that doesn't give you a whole lot of credibility uh, in terms of who you're going to designate as as being deserving of of being punished by having their their claims on you reduced. So no, I, I was, I, 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 God knows what, I don't know who, uh, what, what Graham was thinking. I mean, it's, it just, it's so obviously a, um, a, a, a self-destructive move. And uh, I haven't heard much about it. I think, I think somebody after he, he, that remark was actually a few days ago and I, he, he didn't follow it up. I suspect that somebody managed to corner him in a room and say, yeah, you know, Senator Graham, that is a really stupid idea. It did, it did uh, warrant to Paul Krugman eye roll. I don't know if you guys uh, caught that. Well, <laughs> in, oh, you know, yeah. I, uh, the question. 
<laughs> I, I did. Uh, what did I do? Yeah, I said something or tweeted. Yeah. Who knows? Um, um, I will go to Alexander. You have a quick question. I will unmute you and you can ask Paul. Sure. Uh, what are some of the best sources for information or news that you, you like to read that you could recommend to us? Oh, wow. Um, Paul's blog, first of all, or his Times pieces. Well, the t there, unfortunately, there was no longer a single blog, a, a separate blog. It just looks like a column digitally. Um, but no, what do I read? I read, uh, I mean, look, uh, <laughs> the fake news media are actually pretty damn good. Uh, the, uh, uh, I read the Times, the Washington Post, uh, uh, the, the news section of the Wall Street Journal. I want to take their opinion section pick it up with tongs and carefully convey it into a, a, a sealed container. But the rest of it is actually very good reporting. Um, on financial stuff, I've been reading both Bloomberg and CNBC, uh, which have been very good at, at keeping up with things. And then, um, uh, you know, um, economics, Twitter. Uh, it's funny. We, we My had, students we, laugh at me when I tell them that. <laughs> we, we had a... a uh, a very vibrant economics blogosphere a few years ago. And unfortunately, a lot of it's moved into social media, uh, which I think is actually inferior. I mean, a tweet storm is just a very awkward way of doing a blog post. But the fact of the matter is people will read the tweet storm uh, much more than they'll read that. And then so you follow, uh, uh, there's a whole bunch of people I follow. Uh, you can actually go to, uh, to my Twitter feed and you can see who it is I'm following. And, and it's, uh, I'm finding it extremely useful for quick, when something happens, you know, we get uh, this morning's unemployment uh, claims number. How do I make sense? Uh, what, what is that saying? And, and um, you're getting quick tweets from Justin Wolfers or Ernie Tedeschi, uh, people who actually know their way around this stuff, um, who are well informed and it's more or less instantaneous. So it's actually, you, you have to, you know, don't, you don't want to be following uh, I don't know. There, there are. You, you need to be selective. Um, but uh, and by the way, this is true of lots of fields. I mean, I'm I'm now I've added uh, epidemiology Twitter to my feed because uh, it's a field I don't know. But I, I think I have learned enough to know who who to take seriously on this stuff. So um, yeah, it's a it's a crazy thing. Uh, it's uh, who knew? But uh, I miss blogs. But here we are with with social media instead. Yeah, I think Mark Toma ran, at Oregon ran the the kind of default blog. And oh yeah, he, he's retired, and and that was always a great source to go to. Um, yeah. But it seems like all the bloggers have gone onto Twitter. Yeah, I mean, I I I actually do something now quite often, which is I will, if I have something longer form to say, I will put up a blog post, a tweet that links to the blog post, but then also follow it with a tweet storm because I know that a very small fraction of people will actually click through to the, to the link. It's just it's one of those weird things that uh, it, it's, it's like, uh, it's like the uh, design of shopping malls. Yeah, it turns out that you have to design a shopping mall so that people don't know that they might have to walk more than 200 feet. They will in fact walk, walk much further distances provided that you have enough angles that they don't see that's gonna happen. So if you say, if you put a link that people have to click on, they won't do it, uh, but if you can, trick them into actually reading something long in the form of a 17 tweet tweet storm, they will do it. <laughs> um, I've learned that with my students. Yeah. Right. Click on this link. Now, not clicking yeah. on it. Yeah. I, I, think, I think that's human, human nature. Um, I'm going to ask Paul to hang out here for a few minutes afterwards. We are at one o'clock. If you don't mind hanging out, if anyone uh, just didn't want to ask a question in a big group setting, I will let people slowly start signing off. Uh, yeah. I want to thank Paul. President McCullough was here earlier. He had left. He wanted me to pass along his thanks uh, for doing this for our students. Um, we are greatly appreciative. I, I told our students this is not something that a lot of universities have the privilege of, of being able to sit in and, and listen to and hear, um, okay. hear, hear, hear you talk. Um, okay. Um, so I'm greatly appreciative. I do have a question for you. I'm, I got your address from Robin. Basil Hayden's or East Taylor, what would you prefer? What, sorry? Bourbon, Basil Hayden's or E.H. Taylor, what would you prefer? I haven't made up, I've, you know, I've just gotten into bourbon relatively recently, uh, partly thanks to you. So uh, we're, uh, <laughs> uh, so mostly, 
mostly my default is scotch. Um, scotch. Okay. I'll ask, I'll ask President McCullough uh, a good scotch and I'll, I'll get one sent over to you when you're, when you're so you okay. won't have to go out and get any Yeah. Or, or if you just want to select a bourbon, that's fine. But the, okay. uh, um, but yeah, um, I am um, drinking more in this. Uh, <laughs> it's not, 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 a, not I hope at, at pathological levels, but it is true that, that uh, it somehow seems to be much more natural to have a drink at, uh, with, with some salsa and chips at, at, at 5.30 than it, than it was before. Hey, 5.30, that's better than uh, 2.30, which may happen in this household on occasion. <laughs> I've been trying. It's, fi it's 5.30 Easter. <laughs> set the boundaries there for myself. Um, um, so any, uh, I'll let Paul give some parting words as students head out. Uh, advice for them to get through these last three or four weeks. Wow, I, I'm not sure I have any. I mean, um, I mean, let me just say that that this is really rough, and it's it's extremely rough if you're if you're in the path of it, or if you have people you know and and uh, uh, that 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 uh, have have been hit with the disease. Um, but it is also, you know, that's um, that this is history. This is something quite remarkable is happening. And, and if I may say, I, um, uh, you know, it looks like the death toll is gonna be a lot less than some of the fears. And one of the reasons is that people are behaving better than we thought they would. Uh, one of the revelations has been that, that, uh, that the general American public is a lot more responsible than a lot of people feared they might be. And uh, uh, I certainly see it you know, when, when I'm out, that, that people are, obeying uh, the social distancing people uh, when when the word came out that you'd have face masks it's now uh uh you know every, everybody looks like a bandit and it's um uh <laughs> and uh, so in some ways well, i think we're actually learning some good things about human nature and our national character in all of this it's not much of a silver lining to what is really a pretty horrible event but there is something perfect yeah i think that's the the reality of of this is it's not easy um for a lot of college age students this is oh. their first real experience of of uh, uh, i mean it, it's unique for us right we've lived yeah. through the great recession and, and we've studied historical economic downturns and this is something that is just unprecedented and now to be 18 19 20 21 years old and Those try to days. make heads heads or tails of what what's going to happen in a week yeah, and also experiences that you're going to be at, at best postponed. I mean, you know, the uh, uh, a lot of European countries have a Wanderjahr or something where people actually are encouraged to go and you know travel the world, hitchhike around, see stuff. And uh, boy, now we're all kind of shut in our in our in our backyards if 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 we're lucky enough to have them. So wow. Um, uh, yeah, I, but, I think that's the advantage. I, I, I'm greatly appreciating being in Spokane right now where there's some yard and some outside and some blue sky as opposed to, and you, you said before people got on, you'd got out of the city yeah. into some space. Yeah, we had our daughter has asthma, lives in Queens normally, said Let's, this is not a good idea. So we all retreated out to, to, uh, to Princeton and um, the, uh, um, and uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm running most days and, and on the, uh, there is a small park that's been kept open. Uh, uh, the big parks have all been closed here, but the, uh, and I'm, I'm running on the, the poetry trail through, uh, the uh, Greenwood Meadows park, uh, every day. And yeah, it, it could be a lot worse and it is a lot worse for many people. Yeah, no, it is. I'm going to unmute Connor. He had a quick question that came in. Go for it, Connor. Yeah, sorry for the exterior noise. I'm cooking right now. I just want to add, well, one, thank you so much for your talk. And two, I always, I, I want to hop on the opportunity for this. It doesn't have to be about economics, but do you have any specific book recommendations for college students like us? Oh, boy. Sci-fi, here it comes, or indie music, which one? <laughs> no, I mean, uh, no, I mean, indie music. Actually, I did a, I did a, uh, a, a little uh, video talk with uh, the, the leader of, of an indie band yesterday. So that that will probably be, uh, posted uh, on my Twitter feed in, in a day or two. Um, but God, I don't know. I mean, it's uh, uh, so much stuff out there. Um, but 
I don't know this might this might be a good time if you if if you really are isolated to you know read some grand old classic uh, uh, you know things. This is uh, uh, how how about uh, Anna Karenina or uh, or uh, Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire? You know, that, that's a, uh, <laughs> I don't think you're leaving. I'm very optimistic, Paul. <laughs> uh, well, or you know the the uh, yeah, it, it's it's one of those. I'm, I'm certainly reading more uh, stuff. I'm also reading a lot of junk, but that's, that's okay. Um, and, uh, and kept getting some of my uh, Netflix uh, and uh, Amazon prime uh, video backlog uh, filled in. So here we go. So I got to ask, what are you uh, binge watching on on Netflix right now? Um, actually on uh, Netflix, I've been a little short on the, on the binging. Uh, I, it's uh I, I just um, I just did uh, went through the entire uh, Westworld series to catch up to the present. Uh, but that's uh, that's HBO, which I'm getting through Amazon. Um, and uh, uh, um, I'm, I've watched a lot of science fiction, as you can tell. Uh, Altered Carbon was okay. the uh, was my Netflix binge recently. So here we go. Yeah. No, I I, I know the feelings. I'm. I'm spending late nights, you know, with obviously the, the textbook in, in macro chapters. <laughs> All right. I, <laughs> I actually have a, it, everyone's different. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an early morning person. Uh, okay. Um, and at, I usually at 6 PM, I, I, uh, I turn off, uh, his, his work of, of all kinds, especially news and, uh, <laughs> And, uh, and that, that's when I go in for, for novels and, and TV shows. Yeah. That's, that's about when 6 PM is when I finally are able to actually with kids being homeschooled and all the fun dynamics of that. Oh boy. It, yeah. It's, yeah. it's interesting. Uh, Josh, I'll unmute you. You can ask Paul his question and I hope Paul's not offended that I keep referring to him as Paul. That's, uh, I'm not a, uh, yeah. I'm not, I'm not a, a titles type person. We will let Josh ask his question. I unmuted you, Josh, and then we will wrap it up. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. Um, just a quick question, kind of off topic from the whole virus, uh, you know, discussion, but uh, have you heard of the Belt and Road Initiative by any chance? Of the which, sorry? The Belt and Road Initiative, China's. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, what do you think of it? I mean, it's a little hard to be sure how much of it is real, uh, it, it, but it's, uh, but they are they are financing a lot of infrastructure ports and stuff. And uh, um, it's something in between. Uh, on the one hand, it's great to see, you know, good old fashioned infrastructure investment that might help economic development. On the other hand, they seem to be saddling a bunch of countries with debts and it looks a little bit like uh, uh, Cecil Rhodes and his, uh, 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 railway across Africa as uh, in order to uh, subjugate the continent to the British Empire. So it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a mixed thing, but, you know, give the Chinese some credit for vision. They are, they're actually out there doing stuff and, uh, and trying to, uh, uh, in a way, make the world a, a smaller place, which on the whole, in spite of everything we're seeing right now, would, is a good thing. Well, I will wrap it up with that, Paul. Thank you. I will okay. send you an email. I'm going to end our meeting. I appreciate you spending your Thursday afternoon with us. I'm yeah. indebted for, to you for your time. Okay. Thanks much. And uh, I see on my, uh, I see that my copy edit has just come in. So I'm going to uh, deal, with, uh, deal with my other job. Okay. All right. Thank you, Take Paul. care. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.